All right, good evening, everybody. Sincere thanks to all of you for being here tonight, and um, we will try to give you as much information as we can, and we'll do some Q&A at the end of the conversation. My name is Matt Miller. If I haven't met you yet, proud superintendent, Lakota Local Schools. My name is Chris Basarge. I'm the chief operations officer for Lakota Schools. And we're going to do a tag team, and we're already getting that we need to speak loudly. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're going to try to do that the best way we can. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about our, the beginning stages of our master facilities plan. Nothing has been decided. We're taking a look at our current facilities and what our future needs are, current needs and future needs. So we're going to talk a little bit about that process tonight. But again, this is the very, very early stages of our, of our planning and of our discussions. One of the things that we've been very intentional about in person, online, and in paper format is getting community feedback. And so I'm hoping that you saw that. I'm hoping that's probably one of the reasons why you're here, because you saw the posting somewhere across the district, or you got an email, or you saw it on social media. Uh, one of the things that we've been intentional about is taking that feedback and using it, and, and not just listening, but actually acting on what we've heard from our community, community and from our stakeholders. One of the first things that we did that we kept hearing about when, uh, just a few years ago was all day kindergarten. For those of you with younger kids or maybe even a little bit older kids, if you recall, you had to get into a lottery for kindergarten. But we believed in listening to our community and to our stakeholders that all day kindergarten was important for our earliest learners. And so is literacy. So that was one of the, the feedback items and points that we got from our community. Another thing that we heard loud and clear from parents and from staff members and from community members was a more of a full complement and robust offering of specials. So again, feedback heard, we took steps, the board took steps, Board of Education took steps to make those things happen. Another thing that our students were at a disadvantage was, with was technology. So not that we wanted to put kids in front of screens for eight hours a day, that's horrible. I don't know anybody that thinks that's a good, good use of tools, but it's just that, it's a tool. So we heard from our community that our kids were a little bit further behind some of their peers in neighboring school districts around us. And again, we listened and we, we reacted to that need. And so we didn't want to take our kids to a point where they were even with other districts. We're trying to engage them and give them a leg up um, to our competitors, so to speak, around us. So we're still accessing those tools and getting things out. Another feedback loop item that we heard was from our business community is there is a huge amount of need in cybersecurity. So that's just one more example of listening to our community about where there are jobs and we have kids that want to do those jobs. So we just launched the Liber Lakota Cyber Academy just this year. The Board of Education just about a year ago approved a uh, mission statement and vision statement when we talk about our strategic plan. You can see the mission statement up here right now. Um, but we made these changes because we want everything that we do to design, design to provide a future ready, student centered learning experience for every single child. Everyone talks about how big of a district we are, and we are. But sometimes being large is a good thing. I think we can pivot faster. I think we have the resources. We certainly have the staff and teachers to make things happen for each one of our kids. So we took that into account when we were designing our strategic plan. This is our vision. These are our four tenants that we've been using since the strategic plan was adopted just a year ago. Personalized, future ready, fiscally responsible, which is huge to the board and to our treasurer, and that we are in this together. And that's why you're here. So we, wanna, we want you to hear what we're going to talk about with the facilities, but we also want to get feedback, not just tonight, but in the months to come throughout this process. Another piece that came out of our strategic plan is something called a portrait of a graduate. I will tell you that probably, and this is going to sound a little bit negative maybe, um, I will tell you probably about 75 to 80 percent of the school districts in the state of Ohio are focused on getting their kids just a diploma. We know that that's important. We want to do that too, but we want to go a step beyond that and talk about what comes next for our kids. We've talked about the four E's after graduation of employment or enrollment or enlistment or entrepreneurship. So while we want our kids to get those diplomas, we're proud of that. We want them to get that high GPA. We want to build out what comes next. And so the portrait of a graduate helped us get to things talking about what comes next. So these are the skills 
and I know it's kind of hard to see for some of you, but you'll be able to see, see it on our website if you haven't yet, about some of the components in the portrait of a graduate that are important to us. So our strategic plan, our portrait of a graduate, our mission and our vision are living, breathing things. I've been in too many school districts where we do a strategic plan and it goes on a shelf and it sits there for five years and then we get it out again and do it over again. Where we've already made changes and adjustments based on what we hear from our community, from our staff, from our business leaders about what our kids should be doing and what they should have. And we're never going to be in a spot where we're done. And that's why we're now looking at our facilities and how we can create spaces for the best conditions for learning for our kids. So we're looking towards that future now. And Chris, I might be handing it to you. Um, a couple of things to note real quick before I turn it over to Chris. Um, we're looking now at our, our media centers and learning spaces at all of our schools. So we have innovative spaces um, in our innovative hubs, innovation hubs now at our early childhood schools. And we're also rolling out, kind of tied to the cybersecurity program, something called Incubator EDU. So if you've seen Shark Tank, um, we have kids now that will be taking classes at East and West using current staff to build something out like that. Another feedback loop that we heard from our community is something um, that maybe you've heard about, freshman busing. Um, so we are rolling that out as well. So we're trying to be reactive to what our kids need, to what our community tells us, and this is the next step in the process. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, as Matt talked about earlier, our board did approve a, a strategic plan a couple of years ago, and as Matt said, it is an active document, living, breathing, that we work towards every day. And one of the components of that strategic plan was to update our master facilities plan. And this is where we are today um, in the beginning stages of that process to update our, our master facilities plan. Um, we just want to be ready for the future. We do a lot of planning. You know, the treasurer does her five-year forecast every year, and looks at how we're going to be over the next five years. Um, Craig Hatfield is my senior director of Buildings and Grounds. He looks at our, our building plans, what we can do for capital projects. We work with building administrators to look what we can do um, to plan out over the next five years for capital improvements. Um, we do a lot of things like that um, and making a plan for our facilities. It's something that we need to do and have a long-term vision beyond just five years of what our facilities need to look like. So um, with that, um, we'll talk about the process here a little bit. There's a, uh, an organization called the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission based in Columbus. They are a state organization that help uh, support schools in the uh, building of new schools throughout the state of Ohio. Um, with that process, um, the board went through what is called a um, expedited local partnership program where we can apply to be a part of this program with the state. ELP is a short name for it. And what happens with that is any kind of projects that we do in the future as part of our master plan, we will get credit towards um, a reimbursement from the state. So we'll go through this process at some point. We'll get a, a full master plan. And a master plan is a look at all of our facilities, what we want to do long term for improvements, upgrades, the whole gamut. And once that plan is approved, any work that we do towards completing that plan will be uh, credited with the OFCC. Um, our current rate is 26%. So if we get in our plan that we need to replace a roof at a certain building, and in two years we replace that roof, and as part of our master facilities plan, um, when, our, when our funding number comes up with the state, we'll get 20%, 26% of those dollars back from the state of Ohio for participating in the ELP program. Um, the uh, commission will also do an enrollment study. We had one done a year ago um, through an organization, and we'll talk about enrollment here in a minute. But part of the uh, study from the state looks at our current enrollment and future enrollment and how that will impact our facilities going forward. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to that in a little bit. Facilities committee. Our facilities committee is comprised of um, our treasurer, superintendent, a couple board members, um, our facilities uh, leader, myself, and uh, is, is the, the core committee. Then we'll have ad hoc committees such as um, parent groups, student groups, staff groups that will come in and provide feedback throughout this process as well. Um, and what we do is we take a look at all the recommendations from the OSC, the assessments that they do, our enrollment projections, 
working with our architects and we'll develop some options that our district can look into as we move through this process. Good. Let's make sure I don't miss anything. Um, another component of the process is called educational visioning. Um, there is a person named Tracy Richter, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, to be an opportunity for folks to participate. Tracy is going to do a lot of small group sessions where he'll talk to staff, students, parents, uh, community leaders, business leaders, and uh, community members about what do you think our education should look like for our students going forward in the future. Um, he'll talk about programs. Um, how we want um, our educational process to look in the future. And what he does with that, and he'll sit down with our architects and say, okay, here's our vision for educational programs and what we want to do with our kids. And our architects will take that and work with him and develop our, our facilities to match that. So if we want to offer certain programs, we need certain types of facilities and spaces within our facilities to match those educational programs. So that's part of the educational visioning process, which is required by the state if you want to qualify for that 26% uh, reimbursement. Just to go back really quick, uh, you might have said it, but I, but I don't remember. Uh, when we talk about engaging with the OFCC in that 26%, we're not bound by that. We can go through this whole process and the Board of Education can decide that we're okay with our current facility, so that's still an option. So we did not tie our hands, so to speak, into moving forward. That's just a, a component I want to make sure I said. Right, because if you do participate with the state, there's, they have a, a manual that you have to follow. and They have prescribed certain things that they want to see within the buildings. A lot of it is best practices, but there may be some things that our community does not support and they don't want to do. And if we do some changes that we want to do, we would pay for those our, ourselves as a community and uh, wouldn't get that 26%. So as Matt said, there's no obligation to do it. Um, and if we decide that we want to do our own plan and, and not go through the state, we have that option as well. And the last point um, is a community input. This is our first community meeting throughout the process. There'll be uh, ample opportunities to be uh, engaged um, as we move through this process. Um, one thing that we are going to launch, because we know people's schedules are busy, they can't always attend meetings. Um, so there'll be opportunities to provide feedback through um, a platform called Thought Exchange. Thought Exchange is a, uh, a platform where we can ask questions and get feedback from our community on a broad range of questions and items and, and things that we want to get feedback on. Um, it's, it's anonymous when you go sign up, so you don't feel like you, you have to put your name out there, but you have some ideas and people can go read your ideas and you sort of rank those ideas and the ones that sort of are more popular filter up to the top and sort of gives us an idea of what our community is feeling through the st thought exchange that, hey, these ideas are something that we want to pursue in our facilities plan. It doesn't mean that if your idea doesn't float up, that doesn't mean it's not a, a good idea at all, but it's just the process goes through and the ones that are, are more active get more input into the process. Did I miss anything on that, Betsy? No. No, uh, so our first thought exchange on the uh, master facilities plan will go live uh, tonight, and we've got uh, Bitly that you'll see at the um, at the last slide, as well as the QR code, and we've got some handouts too. And we would really encourage you to go through and participate with Thought Exchange. And once you add your thoughts, make sure that you go back in, um, and we'll be open until February 11th, and go back in and see what other people are saying, and make sure that you star them, whether or not you agree. If you agree strongly with what a thought is, you would put a five. If you don't think it's, um, if you don't necessarily agree with it, or don't think it's that important, then you put a one. The other, just another thing to mention is we're videotaping this tonight, and so future meetings will also be videotaped for the community meeting, so if you can't go to the next one or you want to come back and see what we talked about in this one, uh, they'll be on the website as well. The next part I'll talk about is the enrollment study. Um, last year we did an uh, enrollment study. It's a 10-year forecast that looks at our enrollment throughout the district um, at all grade levels. I'll go through each map here and point out um, at the end of the 10 year what, what it looks like from a, an enrollment standpoint. So for, I know it's hard to see back there what it says, but the colors are, the green colors are those areas that increase by more than 75 students at the end of the 10 year period. The yellow one, there's a small increase of a little less than 75 students. The orange ones are a decrease of 75 students, and the red is a decrease of more than 75 students. So as you can see, and a lot of you just 
by driving around our community understand that a lot of our growth nowadays is in the Liberty Township area. Um, there's some areas still to grow in Westchester, but most of it is built out with residential already. So over the next 10 years, you'll see um, the growth areas will be in the Liberty Township area where you have slight declines in um, the Westchester area. It doesn't mean our population is declining. It means students of school age are declining. We have a lot of uh, families that love this area and want to stay in Liberty and Westchester. So when their kids uh, matriculate through the system and graduate, they stay around and become empty nesters. And those are no longer kids in those houses that we need to serve. So that's why you'll see um, some, <coughs> some of the declines in those areas. And this is for the, uh, for those who can't see, this is for the uh, pre-K through second grade. So get a look at that right now. This is for our elementary schools, grades three through six, with the different school zones. Again, you'll see through the uh, Westchester Township areas, more of a uh, flat to decline and uh, slight to, uh, significant growth in the green areas on Liberty Township. Just from looking at the, the areas here, um, we know one of the things through our planning process we'll need to address is Cherokee. Um, as you drive up by Cherokee lately, there's a lot of new homes that are still being built around that area. And as you look at the, uh, at the forecast that we currently have right now, there's a bubble that goes through our system. The kids that are currently um, uh, preschool, kindergarten, first and second grade, there's a bubble that's going to go through our system. And at the end of the 10 years, they'll be um, getting close to being in the elementary schools. The last part of those will be sixth graders. But in the Cherokee area, um, where we see a bubble come through a lot of schools and go back down, Cherokee goes up and just stays. So that's something that we'll need to address as a facilities committee and as a community, how do we address the growth at Cherokee. We'll see a similar growth in Independence, but if you look at it right now, Independence has about 100 fewer students in Cherokee. So even though they'll grow about the same rate, they have more capacity at this moment in time to absorb those students where Cherokee will outgrow their current um, classroom structure as it stands right now. This is for the 7th uh, and 8th grade junior schools. Um, and as that bubble goes through, you'll see the kids that are, 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 will be in the junior highs at that time. There's a moderate growth in, in the Liberty, uh, or the uh, Westchester Township area, and a little bit more growth in the Liberty Township area, as we would expect. And lastly, um, the high school areas. We looked at it, when we looked at the forecast, the numbers were within 100 kids or so of both high schools at the end of the forecast. Um, between growth and look how large our high schools are, that's not much of a change. It stays pretty constant throughout, so we feel our, our high school enrollment um, will be good and our buildings are able to, to uh, support the, uh, the high schools at this time with the enrollment. Um, now we want to talk a little bit about our, our facilities. Um, this is sort of a, uh, it's not sort of, it is a graphic. It gives you an idea about our facilities. Um, when I first started here back in um, 2007, we were building Wyandotte, uh, Endeavor, East Freshman, doing renovations to the high schools. Um, it seemed like it was just yesterday, but those buildings are already 11 years old. So if you look at that, I'm like, wow, time flies, right? We have a um, so if you look at currently, we have six buildings that are 30 years or older right now and four buildings that are over 50 years old. Um, and as you go through the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you'll see that our, the number of buildings age out um, pretty rapidly. And if you think about what goes on in your own home after 20, 30, 40 years, the kind of improvements that you need to do within your homes, um, you know, you have roofs that need to be replaced, windows, flooring, times that by 25 schools at a uh, couple million square feet. It, it's a lot of, of, of uh, buildings to maintain and upkeep. If you do walk through our buildings, you see for the most part, um, our, our custodial staff and our maintenance staff do a great job um, keeping the buildings looking good. People walk into high schools and go, wow, these buildings are 20 plus years old already? I can't believe it. Um, and they are the oldest in Butler County at this point, if, if you can believe that. Um, right. I know this is maybe harder for people to see in the back. Um, 
the OCC goes through and does an evaluation of all of our facilities. And when they look at that, they look at um, a lot of different components. They look at all of our mechanical, electrical, uh, plumbing, flooring, just general spaces um, and their adequacy for education. And they'll go through and they'll do an evaluation and give us a grade on our, our current facilities. And this is a, a ever-changing um, process as they update their facilities manual and, and put it to, against how we currently look right now. And as we make improvements to our building, so it's, it's a moving uh, process. And this is really a snapshot in time about what our, our buildings look like right now according to the OFCC. So if you look, the buildings that are green are they considered in satisfactory or good condition. The ones in yellow are borderline and the ones in red that are considered deficient. So with that, we'll have to make some decisions as we go through this process about what are we going to do with our deficient buildings in the OFCC's eyes. Because if the OFCC says they are deficient, there's some um, things that we need to consider. If we want to participate and receive the 26% from the state, um, if they're below, uh, if it's going to cost more to renovate than to rebuild, they will not give us any renovation dollars. They'll say you need to rebuild. So we'll need to look at that through the process and see if we want to rebuild or use locally funded dollars and just renovate. That will be part of the discussions that we have going forward. Um, so as you can see, the Westchester, most of the Westchester schools were sort of in red because they were the ones that were built. The community was built out through Westchester, then moved out through Liberty Township. Um, it doesn't mean that they're, they're not suitable for education right now. It's just a snapshot in time of what the OCC thinks about what we need to do with those buildings. You want to talk about the update in mid-February? Yes. Um, we are engaged with the uh, OCC right now, and they are going through this process to, to relook at our buildings. And um, th this condition rating may change. Maybe it's for the good or, the, or for the worse for some buildings. Um, we're supposed to get that update in mid-February. They're going through right now and doing an assessment. Um, we're providing feedback to them on um, improvements that we made to various buildings that we put in, a new chiller, a boiler, roofs, uh, things of that nature that we've done to improve our, our facilities and keep them up, up to speed. They'll give us credit for that and sort of reevaluate where they stand in, in the overall um, rating based on their, on their current facilities manual. Um, and once we have that back, we'll provide that information back through another community meeting about their, their updates. So when was this done? Uh, this one, last one was done in 2009. What are the main items that are What's that? What are the main items that are deficient? Um, they'll look at things um, just from the, the overall structure, the infrastructure, the building, the age of it. it it's, it's, kind of hard to um, justify because technology, for instance, is one category to look at. And they'll look at technology and say, hey, you guys aren't up to, up to speed with your most up-to-date te technology according to the new manual, which means that we may have to go out and buy a new security system or do some upgrades for life safety system just to be current with the manual. And they'll base everything off the 2020 standards. Um, for instance, when I first came in, when we looked at it, uh, the new upgraded fluorescent lights were the best around, and, and when they did that, you needed these upgraded fluorescent lights. Fluorescent lights are, are gone. LED is a new thing now. So if you don't have fluorescent lights in your building, or you still do, they're considered deficient because they're not LED. They may still be suitable, uh, better than your old school fluorescent lights and, and doing a good job, but they're not LED and not up to current uh, design manual standards. So that, am I miss, missing anything on that, Jim? So. So as we go through, like I said, it's a snapshot in time about what our buildings look like <coughs> compared to the current design manual, and that changes every year. What are the most costly items? I mean, light bulb changes is probably the expensive, but are there other items that are costly? A lot of it will be our HVAC systems. Um, they'll look at HVAC technologies changed. Your control systems have changed. Efficiencies. Huh? Efficiencies. Efficiencies, yeah. Um, so a lot of that will be based on those types of things. Just the overall... Um, Electrical systems that are over 20 years old, um, a lot of times they'll say you need to go replace the entire electrical system in that building. That's just based on their current stand standards. Whether that's a true statement or not, that's something that we as a community and as a committee need to look at and say, hey, we really don't agree with your assessment. 
we think our electrical systems are fine. We've done these things over the past 20 years to do our preventive maintenance, upkeep, and we think we're, we're in good shape and we don't really want to look at that as a consideration. So, like I said, it's a snapshot in time. It's, a, it's a, another data point for us to look at, consider, as we go through this process. Yes, sir? Your chart up there shows eight schools are deficient. Based on the report that you guys got back, what big items are you seeing that's making them deficient versus more of Chris, can you repeat the question? So people can Okay. Yeah, yeah he, he, the question was, Based on the, uh, the the schools up here are deficient versus borderline, what is making those schools uh, deficient versus borderline? And a lot of it is just the age of the building and what the uh, current construction manual says it should look like. So between our technology, our HVAC systems, lighting, um, overall quality of space, it's the whole gamut of, of things that the current design manual looks at. Yes. Uh I'm confused on the conversation. Is this information 11 years old that we're looking at? Yeah, because yeah, that's, that's the last time the OFCC did okay. a full assessment, and that's why we're going through that piece right now. So this may change, because we made some improvements to some buildings. It may get worse. It may get better. Okay. It depends on, on we're just sharing the information that we had from 2019, or 2009, I'm sorry. So two or three weeks, it'll be updated. Right. But that's the current information we have right now. Yes. Um, can we guarantee that a deficient building does not have any um, health or safety issues then for our children? Because the deficiency in the red dot is a little, <laughs> makes me a little nervous, honestly, if I think about Right, yeah, life safety is always, like, yeah, life safety is always a, uh, something that we always look at. So if there's any kind of life safety issue, we always address that immediately. So th there's no I issue or concern from our perspective about any kind of life safety issue. We, we would not put students or staff in buildings that we have life safety issues with. So they're not deficient in those areas according. They may say, okay, your, 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 um, your fire panel is 15 years old. You may need to upgrade your fire panel. That may be something they may want you to look at. But we do PMs on them. We do routine maintenance but to try to keep them up. Mold or, you know, I mean, nope. Deficient is just a, it's, it's a, it's a tough word. I mean, yeah, it, yeah it's, it's just, and it's really based off the current construction manual and based on a brand new school, what it would look like compared to a school that's 40 years old. Of course, there's going to be some areas that are, are not comparable because of the age of the building. It doesn't mean it's deficient <coughs> in, in a life safety standpoint, though. Do you guys not get updates on what they expect out of you, like on a, not yearly, like every other year, like what they expect out of you? Oh, and that's why we're going through this process right now. The state doesn't come in and look at you every single year or every other year. No, but they should have some kind of information that they would share with you on things that change from one year to the next and things that they expect. Yeah, for the design manual. So there, there's things that they expect when they have a new school or you build a new school, the design manual. They expect you to, to design and build a school based on this manual. And when you're going through a process in your master facilities plan, they compare your schools to this current manual. So we don't go through every year and look at that manual uh, to say this is where we need to be according to that manual. We do have our plans where we go through and look at our, our, our plans for five-year capital planning, um, things we need to improve on, life um, cycles of different equipment. Um, and we go through that whole process and look at that internally on what we need to do to keep our buildings safe, clean, in, in a positive learning environment. It doesn't mean that because it doesn't meet the 2020 design manual, it doesn't mean it's not a good building for our use. It may not be at that current standard, but it doesn't mean that we're deficient in that area. Well, and I'm sure a lot of the houses down in the lower portion near Westchester, i.e. I live in the morning, have grown up in that area, probably don't meet the standard conditions, even though I think my house Maybe. is in very good shape. Yeah. Let me jump in on this. Let me, jump, let me jump in real quick on that. A couple things. When Can you and Chris come stand over here? Because then your voice will project a little bit better. How about if I stand here and let Chris stand over there? Is that all right? That's fine, but project. 
Got it. <laughs> if you're wondering if she tells me what to do every day, she does. Um, so a couple, couple things to your point, ma'am, that I wanted to mention. Uh, probably about 11 years ago, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, the state did do more of the coming out to buildings and checking on them. But districts would commit to going through a process like this, but would never follow through on doing anything after that. And so the state got a little bad choice of words, gun shy about doing these all the time. So that's why the board had to pass a resolution to commit, and that's why they're going through the facility process now. So I'm kind of saying I'm blaming Columbus, but I'm blaming Columbus. Um, a, another point that, that you made is about sometimes old facilities or aging facilities aren't necessarily bad. And we agree with that, so that's why we're looking at other things aside from just age. I'll give you a, a great example. Liberty Early Childhood School is almost 100 years old. That building's phenomenal and fantastic. So um, you're right. I mean, you got to look at other things aside from just age. I'm going to talk about a couple. We can come back to this slide. I'm going to talk about a little bit about what's coming next. And so, but after that, then we can we can open it up for Q and A a little bit. And if we need to come back to this one, we will. But I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So, next steps: community meetings are always going to be online. We're going to push that out through our usual social media channels like we always do, but also through email and, and things that, are, that can go home. But the best thing to do is to come back to the landing page when you have a question or you want to check something or for an update, and that's just lakotaonline.com forward slash building our future. So you can always go there for uh, the latest and greatest updates, um, including the information that we're talking about and sharing tonight. Chris already mentioned this too, our online survey called through, a, through a, a portal or through a, a site called Thought Exchange. So the first time you use it, you kind of get used to it, but after that it goes really, really quick. Um, and I've seen other schools have really good success with getting their feedback um, using the platform called Thought Exchange. We're also going to be doing some sessions with our educational uh, visionary, and, and Chris already mentioned his name, Tracy Richter. But we are going to be soliciting um, feedback from all of you, not just tonight, but we're going to have breakout sessions um, with staff, with students, with our parents, and our community, how we can use our facilities to best support our school district and our community now and, and 10, 20, 50 years from now. And then the, there'll be a, a board approval or not. They'll have to make a decision on anything moving forward um, in May, so May of this year. May 11th, there it is. Where is that meeting at? Uh, that'll be at Plains. Yep. And we'll put that on the website too if it's not already. It's a regular board, scheduled board meeting. Yeah, regular scheduled board meeting. And hopefully you see more information about it by then and um, it'll be out there. What am I missing? If you are interested in participating in an educational visioning uh, component of this. we hope that this, you are. Oh, what's that? And we hope that you are. Yeah, we, we're going to have some on February 4th and February 5th. If you're interested, we have a sign-out sheet back here. If you want to sign up, I'll send you an email and let you know the times and dates if you can make it. We're glad to have you come out and be part of the uh, educational visioning process that we're looking at with Tracy Richter. Before we open up the like, general Q&A for the whole group, I'm sure Chris will stay. I'll stay. There are board oh, yeah. members in the audience, too. And They'll stick around and staff members too. So if you don't get it out in the open session or you just want to come to one of us and ask us something or tell us something, you can do that too. But just opening it up now for the greater good. One more slide. One more slide. <laughs> oh, there's the bit.ly. So if you have one of those fancy iPhone things or maybe an Android, if you do a picture of the little thing, that'll, that'll take you to the Thought Exchange link. <laughs> And you can start your thought exchange as you're sitting here. Or you can just enter in the Safari or whatever the other one is in Android, the Bentley link at the bottom, um, and it'll pull up that thought exchange. There's also um, at the bottom there, it says master plan at lakotaonline.com. That is a, oh, yeah. a dedicated email that comes to us. So if you have any questions about the master facilities plan, the process, um, anything that you heard here tonight, please send us an email at master plan at lakotaonline.com. Questions? Yes, ma'am. I actually have a comment, um, kind of going back to that deficient building piece. Um, having been involved in the district since before 2009, I don't feel that the district has looked at that, that 
um, picture or chart and decided, okay, we'll sit back and see what happens. A lot of those buildings that were deemed deficient back then have had improvements right. made to them over time, and they may not come back as deficient now. It's not that they've just been sitting there waiting to see when they crumble. So that's just an <laughs> observation from the parent communities who never see a point as well. We did not plant her to say that. <laughs> <laughs> sure sounds that way. <laughs> Thank you for that comment. And you're, you're exactly right, because Chris and his team and crew do a whole heck of a lot um, all year round when things come up. So there's always something going on. Yes, ma'am. In talking about the enrollments and even the school ratings, mm -hmm. I noticed the academy is white and that probably didn't yeah. exist. Right. But also, even in talking about the enrollment projections, that didn't exist on any of the slides. Where's the academy in any of this? So since it's pretty small, and I don't think it was part of that initial 11 years ago, if I'm saying well, that right. But and academy is still considered part of the high school. So it's considered, uh, the numbers are part of the high school numbers for enrollment. They look at the age of the students. So the academy numbers are, are they're, they're both east and west students. So they'll right. fit into that. So there's not a specific enrollment count for the academy because it's a standalone program. Okay. And that's, a, that's another example of, uh, that facility has been upgraded a lot lately. I mean, the last couple of years. I mean, it's mm -hmm. pretty nice right now. Compared but to, it's right. Tiny it is tiny. Kids that are there. Agreed. Right. right. So that's something we'll have to talk about. Right. Yeah, and let's talk about this. That's just one program that we're offering for kids, and is that the right space for it? That's something we need right. to talk about through this process. If we want to offer that program to be able to expand it, what are our opportunities for that to expand, and where would we do that? So if you don't know about the academy, it's a career readiness academy. For some of our students that are at East and West, they go to that, that building. It's, it helped, some of it's online learning, some of it's face-to-face. -face. It helps get them either graduated or caught up, different, different unique pieces. Um, the last slide that was the prediction for the growth patterns, or maybe two slides ago, I'm not sure. You gotta keep, uh, yeah, those. That high school one? Yeah. Sorry. Are those 11 years old or are those? Like no, those schools? were done last year. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And Good that's thing. what it will look like at the, at the end of the 10 year forecast. We did a 10 year forecast last year. So that's what it will look like at the end of the 10 years. One so 2028. On that, I did have a question about. So in the yellow, yellow zone to the south, is it? Is it a multiplier on the 75 students, or is it really saying that there will only be a growth of less than 75 units total? Total. In that entire area? In that entire area. Okay. Because those numbers were shockingly low to myself, but that's just general. It, it, and the way it was explained to us is that's the area where people, their kids are getting older, they move out, and no one's well, downsizing. That's what I mean. Our enrollment slide before to the north of Liberty. Our enrollment of Liberty, before Santa Lana, right now with this, right? We can put it up, right? so they can go through and look uh, at it, right? Uh, uh, we'll we'll add here. that. Yeah, uh, yellow, Van Gordon absolutely shocked me with right. all the rural area right. that's still out there. They're saying that the growth is going to be less than 75 units, and I, I was shocked to see that number. Yeah. That's why I wanted to verify that right. number. And I don't think it's on the on our site right now, but we'll add it the uh, enrollment forecast. We'll add it to the master facility site. You'll be able to go in and look at uh, detail detail of every every one. Because if you look at these blocks, we call these planning blocks, and each one of those planning blocks are um, in the enrollment forecast. It tells you how many kids they expect to grow in each one of those blocks. And we take those blocks, and they all add up for the Cherokee Zone Van Gordon. So we look at it. We do it by block and put those blocks together to get the enrollment for that building. So it's a very detailed plan. We'll put that on um, as one of the uh, supporting documents for the master facilities plan. So you can go in and take a look exactly about how many students are gonna grow and what buildings and, and uh, projections for that. And that's also being looked at now as well because the um, state wants to look at um, these numbers as well and verify and make sure they're comfortable with it as well. Yes. Um, are, are we looking at district lines again? Are we looking at just district lines again was the question. <laughs> I think one of the, the process will look at everything. So as we look at growth in the north and decline in the south, I, I think we need to look at that. We've always done that as a district since I've been here and even before that. And Sandy Wheatley in the back, can, she's re lived that multiple times and probably doesn't want to hear about that again. But um, that's one thing that we need to look at as a community of what makes sense um, to do. Um, so there may be an opportunity to look at lines instead of uh, building a new building you look at lines so that may be a more cost-effective way to look at how we manage growth and 
utilization of our building. So it's, it's definitely something that we need to look at for sure. Are there any, well, what sort of plans are being considered? Is it mostly just replacing existing facilities or you know, moving some lines around or are there more say drastic measures? You I, know, three high schools, one high school, you know what I mean? Other Right. I, I think we'll go through our, our, our game plan is to look at all this data and sort of put together some options for the community to look at. Say, okay, based on what we know about growth, ages and buildings, recommendations, we, we would like to look at this great configuration, these schools uh, being renovated, these schools maybe being replaced, these schools, whatever that may be, give various options so we can get feedback about what people like or don't like. So that's sort of what we would like to do is look at what can we do to support our enrollment growth, support our educational plans going forward, and, and give some options for the community to consider about, yeah, we like this, we don't like this. So maybe we have, like, option A is this plan. Option B is this plan. And they're all a little bit different. And maybe we come back and say, we like this part of option A and this part of B, and that becomes our new master facilities plan when we add them together. So that's sort of how I envision this working going forward is um, providing options, getting feedback, mismatching what things work and what things don't, what will be supported by our community, what won't be supported by this community, and come up with a plan that uh, has a general consensus from everybody that we can move forward with and send up to the state for approval. And that's all going to be done by May 11th? That is our goal. <laughs> <laughs> It's a multi. It's a what? There was one that might be the academy. That was the academy. Yeah, that was the academy. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very small. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, it's very small. But um, Bessie just made a, a this, this plan doesn't mean that um, whatever the plan is going to be, because it will look at every single one of our buildings, um, and the plan won't all be done at one point. It'll be a multi-phase, multi-look. If we want to do a little portion of the plan, as long as it's approved in this master plan, and we want to do it as a community, um, we submit that up to state, we want to do this part of our master facilities plan. And then they'll come back and say, yeah, you can do that part, community supports that, and you'll get your 26% for whatever we spend on that portion of the plan. So it's not like we're going to have a, a huge plan, we've got to do it all at once. Uh, uh, that's unrealistic. It will be segmented. Okay, segmented, we want to look at this piece first. We're going to do this, so there'll be some natural things that we can look at to improve or get better at going forward. How many years do we have to do it? Do we, do it ten years? Well, once you get the plan approved, you got a year to get funding for whatever you want to do in that plan. And if you don't get funding within that year, you reapply the following year. And if you don't get a, anything, you don't do anything, you reapply the following year. And there's, you don't have to um, go out to get. You can use some of our capital improvement funds. Like I said, if we're going to replace a roof or a chiller and it's part of our plan, we can submit that to the state and start to build credits towards um, that thing. I know people don't like to compare school district to school district, but just for an example, that's what Mason City Schools did. They, they, um, they applied to be part of the ELP program, um, did it, built their high school, did a bunch of renovations, all part of their master facilities plan. And when they uh, put the additions on their early childhood school and renovated their entire middle school, all that was paid for by the dollars they got credit for from the state, so they didn't have to go back to their taxpayers and ask for additional dollars for those renovations. So when you look at the schools like Mason, you talk about wanting to keep up with the local districts. You know, when you go to all of the new schools around Princeton, you look at Mason, they have community mixed-use space. They have the aquatic center. They have the nicer theaters. They have a community space. Is that something that's on the table? Is that something we're thinking about or could we think about? I think it should be something we talk about as a community. What do, what do we want? Yeah, without a doubt. So so yes to that, I mean, as a consideration, not yes that we're going to do that. <laughs> uh, but, but, but yes to I mean, there, there, there's a lot of talk and discussion about what does that look like. We'll obviously involve our government leaders around us and our businesses and what that looks like. Um, those things will have to be locally funded, not state funded. So we have to look at that as well. Yes, sir. The 26% you, you keep talking about, is that a, it's or nothing, or is there, is there a range that we get, if we do part of something, do we get a certain percentage of it? 
Well, the 26% is based on, it's a formula that's created by the OCC in Columbus, and the 26% is the state share for anything that's done in our master facilities plan. So if it's in our plan and we do it, we'll get, if it costs a million dollars, we'll get 20%, 6% of that million as a credit or as in dollars from the state for that. But if you do like 90, 80 or 90% of the stuff that's required for the 26%, do they give you that range or is it all or nothing? It, we'll have to submit whatever we want to do to the state and they got to bless it to say, yep, this, this is part of the plan. You want to modify this? Okay, we can accept that, not accept that. So it'll, there'll be conversations before we submit anything that we want to do um, to make sure we get funding for it or not. So, right. Sandy? I, well, I just wanted to commend you for, someone mentioned about being proactive and I appreciate how proactive this approach is that you're taking because back in the 90s we were always playing catch up i think that was a lot because we were growing so fast but i really appreciate the proactiveness the of taking a long view on the facilities plan and seeing that we can't all do it at once but we have a long view on what we could do so i appreciate that thanks for saying that our board gets credit our five board members get credit for that and we're just trying to get the work done right to us we see it as a continuation of of uh continuous improvement you know the things that we've done in the classrooms with all day kindergarten and one-to-ones facilities just another part of this improvement plan that we want to do to get better as a, as a district and as a community so um, and we we've done everything else with the community input we don't want to do this without community input so um, that's why we want this is our first of many meetings I think um, I know that we'll, we'll try to get feedback and try to build this this plan that will support our kids and our community going forward our, and to that point, our next community, community meeting to give an, an update, a little bit of this again, but more of an update is February 26th, 26th at West Freshman. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> the media center there. <laughs> what does that mean right there? What does that mean? A groan comes over the crowd. Ooh, West Freshman. <laughs> Do I? That one looks red to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I will say the reason why we're moving the meeting from place to place is we always want our community to come into our facilities, and so often you're either at your child's school or you're at one of the high schools. So we're trying to get you into our building so that you can take a look and see what our kids see on the table that and how they're they're learning. Yes, sir. Uh, May twenty you will have a plan that identifies what is to be built, designed, and the cost. Yes. Correct? Yes, sir. And, and will there will also be a projection of how much the taxes will have to be increased to achieve those goals. No, that, that won't be part of the master plan. We'll just be looking at our facilities and the total cost to complete this master plan. There'll be nothing about um, what taxes would be because. If you look at the entire master plan, like I said earlier, we wouldn't do that entire plan in one fell swoop. We'd probably chunk it out in different sections and different uh, areas to look at improvements that we need to do. And as we look at one section, that's when we would have to look at, okay, how do we want to fund this section? Do we need to use uh, dollars in our general fund, use permanent improvement dollars that we already have, or do we need to go out and ask our community to help support this because it's more than what we can afford internally? So that would be decided at a later date as we go through and decide, of this master plan, what do we want to implement first? And that and that will come, okay, how does the funding support that? And Mrs. Logan, our treasurer, Jenny Logan. She, so, she, so one of the next steps after we finalize the master plan is we are going to have to figure out, like, what is that first segment? And then how are we going to fund it? So if we decide that it, it's a combination or we're going to have to ask there is a possibility we would have to ask the community for new dollars. If we do that, we have to figure out, first of all, what's the entire master plan, what is that first segment, cost it out, and then figure out how we're going to fund that. And we are not at that step yet. But no. I don't want you to think that, you know, that's not part of the process, because it is part of the process, but we have to figure out the master plan first. Yes. Those projection numbers, did that include development? You know, you can't predict development. So a lot of those blocks, there's hardly <coughs> any what appears to be development, but I also don't know what 
currently there if it parks or whatever. Right. Our demographer talked to both township uh, community development people and um, building departments. And they talked about what permits they project, what land is projected to be um, over the next 10 years. It's now a farm, but it's slated to be a uh, single home community in, in 10 years. So a demographer did talk to the local uh, jurisdictions about growth and potential growth to incorporate that into his model when he figured out the, the enrollment. So whether that pans out or not, who knows, you know, if the developer decides, hey, they're going to, it's three years later than expected, that could have an impact on our enrollment. So you look like you have a question. I don't have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 can we go back one? Yeah, the, the Van Gordons predicted that less than 75 students per, per growth, grade three through six, for the next 10 years. That's at the end of the 10 year mark. Okay, thank you. There, there may be some up and down, up and down through okay. that, but at the end of the 10 year mark, okay. it's 75. Okay. And if you look at that, there's not a lot of streets in there, I mean, right now. That's right. the whole point of right. it. It's, right. the, right. it's the area that is going to grow. Right. It's the only Maybe. place left. Right. Is that per grade or is that? Three through six total. Like I said, I know we have, we have a bubble going through the system right now that we'll see. And like I said, we'll get that enrollment uh, information. It's 100 plus pages long, and it goes detailed to every, every single block, and you guys can see exactly how many kids are going to be projected at each, each, uh, each area. Anybody else for the good of the order? All right, we will stick around. Thank you so much for being here. Great turnout. Is there anything else you want Again, to say? Again, if you're interested in the uh, educational visioning piece um, on no, uh, February 4th or 5th, um, sign up back here and I'll get in contact with you. Oh, we'll have the video too. So thank, thank you so much for coming yep, out thank tonight. Thank you. And if you didn't get the information about participating in the thought exchange, we have some through our code and business.